cameras on. Um, and I will begin the roll call, but if you have something that you feel that you need to uh, bring up or discuss, you can either put your hand up or you can chat it, let us know and we'll uh, be watching for that. So we want you all to communicate with us during the meeting. So I also would like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the first people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the confederated tribes of the Colville reservation that are still here, continuing to bring their light and heritage. So I want to acknowledge our Colville tribal partners. Now go ahead and st start the roll call. And I always start in the same order. So Carlene Anders. Yes, I'm here. Kathy is here. I'm here, thank you. Deb Murphy. And Del Anderson is going to be late. Uh, Jesus Hernandez. I'm here. Thank you. Ken Sterner. Here. I see you. I'm here. Okay. Ramona Hicks. Thank you. Ray Eichmeyer is out. And then we have Rebecca Davenport. I'm here. Thank you. Rosalinda Kibbe. I'm here. Senator Warnick. Let's see if she called in. She may not. She'll be out. Uh, Dr. Michael Tuggy. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Kat. Good afternoon, I'm here. Hi. Hi. And Teresa Atkinson. I don't see her. She may be coming in later, so I'll go ahead and count her as absent at this time. Now, I would like everyone to review pages 1 through 15 of the board packet, which is the consent agenda. If anyone has any uh, conflict of interest that they would like to declare at this time, please do so. You can do it by either um, taking yourself off mute and, and declaring, or you can also put it in the chat. So thank you for that. We've got the minutes there. Molly, the minutes include the December board meeting, the December special meeting, and the January retreat. Correct. Good. It's a lot. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And then we have the monthly financial statement. So at this time, if everyone has had a chance to review that, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Molly, this is Carlene. I move to approve the consent agenda. And do I have a second on that? This is Ken. I'll do the same. Thank you, Ken. There's a point now for discussion. If anyone has any questions, any clarifications that they would like to ask, now would be the time to do that. And hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed would say nay. And any abstentions? And hearing none, motion carries. Thank you for the approval of the consent agenda. At this time, I also want to open the floor for public comment. Is there any of our partners who I hope would put their names and um, information in the chat for us so that we can count them in to the meeting? But if there's anything anyone would like to bring up, I will also offer this up again at the end of the meeting, just to give you a heads up. So I want to be sure. Um, the board in this bridge year is morphing more to a community um, based informational meeting 
I want anyone who is not a board member to feel like they can also have a say in what um, we're discussing today. So it's kind of a change and, and we'll hear a lot more from people who are just not the board members, but of the community. Um, now, I would like to open the floor for Acting Executive Director, John Chapman. Good right. afternoon, John. Uh, put on the screen, I just have a quick Executive Director update for today to give you guys a heads up of what is going on statewide, organizationally, and with our community partners. And bear with me, this is my first one of the year, my first one in this role. So if there's ever things you wanna see or get updates on that you feel like you're missing, always feel free to email me and let me know. The ultimate goal of this is just to give you guys kind of a quick touch of some of the things that are going on um, that you may not be aware of just with our updates for today. So a few key, key things statewide. Um, as you all know, since Senator Warnock is away, the 2022 legislative session is underway. The primary thing really for North Central ACH and the healthcare authority that we're focusing on is conversations around the waiver renewal and specifically how the accountable community health fit into that waiver renewal. So the state's really pushing um, and talking about the renewal as a whole. Um, all of the nine agencies across the state also want to ensure that legislators understand also the overarching value of an accountable community health. So not just our value as it has been attached to the Medicaid transformation project over the last five years, but the value we've brought to the community as a whole. And a lot of that has the types into with a lot of the conversations we've had about our future state, um, the work that we've been doing in our strategic planning work group that has really been broader than just what this MTC has been about. So I would encourage all of you guys, you know, as well, when those conversations come up, if you're meeting with state partners um, and the conversation around the ACH come up, always be feel comfortable expressing the value that we bring to the region. And it doesn't always have to be focused on clinical transformation. It can be all the work that we're doing to improve health around care coordination, around health equity, and practice transformation. Uh, the waiver, HCA plans to submit the waiver in July of 2022, the waiver application to CMS. Um, from our current understanding, they don't expect to have a fully approved waiver renewal until closer to the end of this year. So it's gonna be similar to the six year extension of the current waiver. We're gonna find out kind of in the later hours of, of the year and then pretty much have to get right on top of it going into 2023. I'll also make a comment if there's ever anything legislative that comes up that you guys see that crosses your paths that you think would be good to share with other board members or the ACH at large, always feel free to email me. I know there's a lot of bills out there and a lot of things to track and it's I'll be honest to say it's never going to be on my radar 100%. I'll, I'll have my specific focuses, but sometimes there's things that I miss. Uh, starting tomorrow will be the first uh, chart advisory board meeting. And for those of you who aren't aware of what chart is, chart stands for Community Health Access and Rural Transformation. And this is a specific grant that the Healthcare Authority got awarded with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services focusing on rural transformation and rural health care payment reform um, beyond just Medicaid, but with Medicare as the starting focus and then gravitating into Medicaid in the hope to be a multi-care model. I know all of the hospital, uh, hospitals that are on the board are probably well aware of this work going on in our region. Um, and they probably have conversations with the health care authority about the pros and cons of this model. Um, tomorrow, again, is the first start of what they have as an advice, advisory council or advisory board that's really going to be helping inform the planning of this work moving forward, especially a community transformation plan that the healthcare authority has to submit as part of this work. And then in November is when that first kind of cutoff occurs where hospitals will have to decide if they're going to be participating in that initial round of the chart model, which would be January 1st of 2023. 
and would be primarily focused on the acute care side and Medicare. I'm briefly touching on that. So those who want more details, feel free to um, ask me outside of the meeting. And then another thing that's coming through the state wide is as if you are all aware or unaware, the healthcare authority during the Medicaid transformation project actually stepped away from the MEHAP assessment, which was a behavioral health integration assessment. Wendy would be able to, I'm gonna just preface this whole topic that Wendy would be able to tell you way more than I. So I will always defer to her for detailed questions, but they've been working with a statewide uh, work group between the ACHS, the managed care organizations and the healthcare authority to develop a better integration assessment and it's called the integrated care assessment. And that will be rolling out the summer of 2022. So they're gonna have a cohort one starting this summer. And the idea is that those providers that have been involved in Medicaid transformation and integration work over the course of the Medicaid transformation would be part of that first cohort. Um, I'm sure some of you again have seen some of this who are directly have directly been involved in this work or are part of one of our clinical partners. Um, but you'll also be seeing more of that coming through this next few months. A lot of that kickoff and that rollout is really going to occur in the next you know two to three months. Just some quick operational updates. One request that I'm going to have and I'll send out to the board. Um, we're working on improving our social media posting. And so there's going to be a request from board or community members that you know to provide feedback on the type of materials that you would like us to start posting and promoting on our social media account. Social media is a great vehicle to get broader community input and engagement into our organization. Um, and we saw some of that specifically around some of the recovery code work that Joey has done and when we posted the Narcan vending machine. What we also know is that social media is a great venue to create, stir up a lot of trouble and other um, communication stuff as well. So we wanna get you guys' input on the kind of material you feel comfortable that we're posting on social media. Um, when we posted some of the Narcan vending machines, Joey, David, and Digital Media Northwest did a great job promoting those statements and those comments that were really supportive of it. And then also really providing feedback and um, written comments back to those who were more highly critical of the Narcan vending machines. And so like I said, it's a great place to really start that conversation, but you do get a really mix of conversation on that. Um, we completed our first month um, separated from the Cheyenne Douglas Health District. And so we will be closing the books on that on that first month over the next couple of weeks. Our goal is to have a new financial statement to you guys by the March board meeting. Uh, Clifton Larson Allen has an initial process they have to go through internally to set that, that statement and what it looks like. So for the first month or so, it takes a little bit more time to go through that approval process. Um, they said that we should be able to hit the goal of the March meeting, but if for any reason, that doesn't happen, I'll let you know and we would have those monthly financials a week or two late. Just other quick updates around the staff. Um, we implemented a COVID policy. And so we are requiring staff members to get vaccinated and receive their booster um, to be employed at North Central Accountable Community Health. We do have religious and medical exemption forms available and we're working with one digital HR would would support us if someone were to submit a medical or religious exemption form. We're all still working remote. Um, you can see Teresa is in the office today um, and staff are going in and out, but we're predominantly uh, remote at this point with a few days and a few individuals in and out of the office during the time. And we are hiring, we are still hiring a director of community data and that position is still open. And so if you know anyone who would be interested or good qualified candidates, please let me know. Last, just some quick updates. Um, our next partner convening is gonna be February 22nd, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, I don't have the, a specific agenda, but 
Uh, Monte will be covering some of that during our board learning later on today, so I won't go into all those details. What I will say is we are starting and going to be trying to encourage board members to get out and engage in some more of these community-based meetings over the course of this year. And so I would encourage you guys to attend. It's a great opportunity to hear what our community members are saying about our work, and that will help inform the decisions you have to make. Um, tomorrow, we start the kickoff of our evolving behavioral health systems work group. There was a small planning group that met last week for two days that really dove into this for about three or four hours total. Um, and Wendy and the components she has worked with has brought them together to get an initial agenda together. And that time tomorrow is, Wendy, can you remind me, is it 12 to 2 o'clock? Thank you. Um, and so those of you who are, again, available, I would encourage you to participate in this. This is really looking at the gaps we have in our behavioral health system and what actionable steps we can take to fill those gaps. Next, uh, we are working with the Visual Network Labs team. And this is a team we're working with to do network analysis, network mapping, to design a survey um, that will go out to external partners, really to look at getting an understanding where our current network is. And then based on that, how can we continue to build out our network of partners? Um, I believe um, at some point we'll have a little bit more information that we can share with the board, but this is just kind of a quick update and you are also gonna be partners. So expect to see a little bit more in the future. And then we have also worked with the Alano Club. Um, and I think this was back in early January or late December. We supported the Alano Club in Wenatchee in submitting a recovery community organization application with the Washington State Healthcare Authority. And they were awarded 150,000 for a year for two years, so up to a total of 300,000. Am I getting that correct? I might be getting that number wrong. Joey? Right. Correct. Um, and so now we are also supporting them with a previous board member of ours, Brooklyn Holton, who is the individual consultant and in helping to get that plan in place and supporting them in really operationalizing that application and that work. And then finally, and I'll throw this um, link in the chat, uh, we are in our second half of the North Central Washington Equity Training that we are doing with the Community Foundation and North Central Washington Equity Alliance. And I'm going to try each meeting just to share at least one or two quick items from it. I'm not going to ask you to watch it today, but I'll throw in chat a TED Talk um, that we have with an individual who um, is Stella Young and she's an individual with disabilities. And the TED talk was, I'm not your inspiration. And it was really focused on, you know, she, grow, she growing up had a lot of individuals who basically said she was inspirational for waking up in the morning because she was disabled. And so really it's how we as a society and we as people sometimes put a stereotype or a stigma on people just because of who they are. And we don't always give them the credit they deserve for the work they do, or sometimes we, you know, in her case, you know, we give them credit for something they feel is normal and they want us to really look at them for credit or want individuals to look at credit for when it's aspirational. I just did a bad job explaining that, but I will put it in the chat. I encourage you guys to listen to it um, in our last equity training. This was the one um, material that most of the partners felt resonated with them and that they could talk the best to them. So I will throw that in the chat. And I think that is it. Any questions? All right. Hearing none, thank you, John. And next on the agenda, it would be Ken Sterner nominating committee for the position of the Schland Douglas Chai seat. So thank Ken, you. are you ready? Yeah. And uh, we met on the 28th. And when I say we, that was uh, part of the committee. That would be myself and Carlene, uh, Senator Warnick, uh, probably for obvious reasons, uh, was not able to attend. Uh, John also joined us and Teresa joined us as well. And uh, 
we actually ended up having uh, three action items. Uh, the first action, of course, is what we had originally intended, and that was uh, to discuss the nomination uh, from the CHI um, about uh, uh, confirming that uh, we would uh, approve the nomination of Nancy Spurgeon as the Shalyn Douglas CHI representative on the board. In that regard, that is the recommendation of the nominating committee. Um, and uh, I think if you go back to your packet and look on page 16, you can hear, you can read about uh, Nancy's bio there. But on the other hand, I think we have the real thing with us. And so I would invite Nancy maybe to say a few, a few words um, and before we actually uh, proceed with a vote to approve her nomination. Nancy, are you there? Yes, once I find the unmute button, uh, <laughs> that, that famous quote of the year, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I am excited about this opportunity. I um, have been involved in uh, many boards and coalitions throughout our community. I retired two years ago, right before COVID. It was an interesting time to retire. <laughs> But right before COVID hit, I retired and um, stayed involved with the early childhood field and with the college. But um, the reason why I was drawn to the ACH and to the CHI is because of my early childhood background and, and um, the understanding in it is that early childhood is much larger than putting four-year-olds in classrooms. It really is about all those foundational things that families and children need. And I think organizations like the ACH and the CHIs can, can help move that message along that children need housing, they need health, they need mental health. Families need all those supports for children to be successful in school. So um, anyway, that's, that's my interest and I'm excited and hopefully you will be able to approve me being part of this group. Thank you, Nancy. So uh, that is our recommendation uh, to the board uh, that we accept Nancy as our new representative for the Shalane Douglas Chai. And I, I guess uh, I make that nomination. I'm looking for a second. This is Kathy, I'll second. Okay, I think I heard Kathy, so thank you very much. And all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, aye. Anyone opposed? And congratulations, Nancy. I appreciate you coming on the board. Thank you. Motion Thank carried. You. So anyhow, uh, in part of our discussion also ended up with two more action items. One of the things that we were uh, discussing is uh, needing to fill some of our open positions that we have on the board. And in that regard, um, we've asked uh, John uh, to put out a call for applicants as well. Um, and he's just gonna create a simple application. Uh, he'll share it with us and then we'll share it with the board. Uh, try and uh, try and get some folks involved in, uh, with our, our group and hopefully we'll get some interest with that. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, John, when do you think we might be able to see that? We will start working on it this week. So for board members, we have two open seats, the consumer seat and the Hispanic seat that doesn't have a standard um, sector representation bring back where you bring it back and they decide and they bring a recommendation to you. We traditionally have done that more as a board. And so the encouragement was really to be broader and allow, we can still you know, recommend people or encourage people to apply, but be broader to allow others that we may be missing to apply for those seats as well. So Ken, I would hope in the next week, um, we would be able to get a draft created. And so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we would have something that could be posted. We can always bring it back to the next board meeting if board members want to see it first, or we can at least just work with the nominating committee to get a final draft that we can post, which is part of the Easiest route. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And in part of that process, in, in discussing that, we one of the things that's come up of we've actually got some uh, folks out there that have expressed some interest in joining our board. 
Um, and uh, what's challenging is we don't particularly have a position according to our, our governance uh, bylaws as to where we would put those. Those individuals, uh, for example, with uh, our elected official uh, speaking specifically, uh, we are seeing some interest uh, from our county commissioners uh, from the four counties of having a representative on our board. And so one of the things that we are uh, suggesting at this point is to start the, or restart, I should say, the governor's committee back up again to look at our board configuration in terms of having elected officials other than our state officials like Judy on board, but perhaps having a county commissioner that might be interested in doing that as well. And so that is just the, the recommendations we have uh, for our our board, and that's it. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we will have our board uh, learning and development piece. Um, we want to continue to be rolling out these board learning and training pieces um, as we go through our bridge year. So I wanted to um, welcome Monty, but J John, did you have anything that you needed to add to this prior to Monty coming on? A little bit of the discussion. Yeah, so as you all know, we, uh, the last two uh, board meeting, the board meeting and the board retreat, we had some national speakers come and talk to us about um, distributed leadership. Um, so really, the thing we, we continue to think on is, you know, one of our key pillars is distributed leadership. And so how do we learn from national speakers to grow from that? And then really, how do we um, start looking at our internal framework and how we're structured as a board and how we're structured as a community to really start looking at how we apply some of those learnings that we've been learning over the last couple of months to ourselves and to our community as a whole. And in regards to distributed leadership and distributed governance. And so today we're kind of moving into that realm a little bit to talk a little bit more, not necessarily just about the national speakers, but also about us as an organization. And so I'm going to turn it over to Monty to get us kicked off. Hey, well, um, hello everyone. I'm Monty Roulier with Community Initiatives and know we've had a chance to share space um, a couple times with my Elizabeth, or Elizabeth Hardig, my colleague. Um, John, I wasn't sure if, you, if we wanted to use any of those other slides, um, making sure yeah. I was following. Yeah, I can uh, share them on my screen. How about that? Great. And so I think there was kind of building on your context. John, I don't know if you wanted to you and Carolina talk a little bit more about that, and I'm happy to jump on as you talk about board zins and then the thriving. That sounds good. You mean just the recap of the meeting? Sorry. Let's see here. I thought there are apologies if I'm <laughs> confused. I thought there were a few slides um, that you were doing um, yeah. before we jumped into thriving together around kind of the board yeah. journey. Oh yeah. So just a few quick things. You guys can see the slides on the screen, correct? I, I'll just take that as a yes. Um, so for, like I said, for the last, two, um, the last two board meetings, we had really national speakers and come and speak. So you can see, you know, reflections. The, you know, we had our speakers from Archie come and join us, the Central Oregon Health Council come and ground health and trend and health being. And you know, again, I would call out that, you know, we all remember Wade from Common Ground coming and he was a very inspirational speaker as speaker, especially in the work that they're doing under Common Ground. And Caroline, we can see your notes up just as an FYI. Thank you. Appreciate that. So you should be seeing reflections a reflection screen? Yep. Okay, thank you. There we go. So just a few kind of key reflections that came to my mind in these speakers, and Carolyn, maybe you can jump in as well and share some of the key reflections you saw. But a lot of what they were talking about 
was, you know, a few things, gathering a authentic community voice. And that's really, you know, I, I listened back to the December meeting, which is sometimes hard to remember. And I remember that the comment came up to talk about active versus passive engagement. So when we're really looking at community voice and engaging our community as a whole, how are we really gathering that? And is that, are we really being active in that voice where the community members feel like they're really contributing to that work or are we being passive? You know, I think in my mind, a, a key example that I could think in regards to our governance is that we've always had a consumer seat on the board, but we've never really seen that seat come to fruition or really bring that full, what we could do with consumer input to our organization. So to me, in ways that is kind of a passive way of, you know, checking the box to get the work done, whereas we need to dig a little bit deeper to see how we can continue to provide an active voice to it. So it was good intentions, but again, we just learn from it and adjust. Another thing I think Wade brought up a lot that resonated a lot with myself is just the notion that, you know, we are supporting the work, we're not the doers of the work. So we support the collaboration and bring partners together for a shared mission, a shared vision, a shared direction. But then we're really relying on the community to go out and do the great work that we're helping support and helping align the mission around. And so, you know, a lot of times when we've looked at the Medicaid transformation project, sometimes we've crossed that line a lot at between um, the convener and the doer. And so as we're focusing on our future state, really looking at how we can stay in our in our lane as really the catalyst for this work is always the direct doer of the work and only be in that position if you know need arises it and it's as a last resort. Carolyn or Monte though, is there any other key themes that you feel like came out of those talks that you think we should kind of keep in our head as well as we're going through today? I think something from January, um, you know, we all went out into breakouts and it sounds like a theme for everyone was just this recognition that we would really have to focus on relationship building in a way that we, we didn't do under the Medicaid transformation. I mean, we built relationships, but I think we're going to have to take it to a whole other level. And um, it's kind of like that if that if trust and relationships are going to be our currency to achieve great things for our region, then we need to build up those reserves this year. And so a lot of that work or even asking you to join partner convenings is about also getting you to be in the same space with some of our funded partners and learn about their work and listen to it and think about like what it means for, as, your, as a board member, your role as a board member, like what should you take back to the board and how should that shape policies? So there, there is this sense that relationship building um, is going to be front and center this year. And I don't know, I think when we were talking with Monty and Elizabeth about today's session, I think we recognize that many of you are probably wondering where, like, where is this heading now that we've heard from national speakers? Um, I think some of you are excited. I think for some of you, it might still feel vague, to be honest. Some days I feel like, oh man, this is still vague. And then some days I, I feel like, oh, I think I know what direction we're going. But this is a chance today to kind of um, voice any of those concerns or, or feelings that you have. Like, are you confused? Do you know where we're headed? And today we're gonna try to provide a little bit of that direction, right, John? Like what to expect in this bridge year. John, do you want me to move to the next slide about the strategy work group, or did you want to see if the board had any other thoughts or comments? Well, do if do board members have any things that they feel like resonated with themselves over the last two meetings that they like to comment on? And you can either type it in the chat or you can unmute and share right now. Well, I'll encourage you guys as we're going through today, if there's, again, if there's things that resonate, please feel free to keep dumping them in the chat um, throughout this conversation or this presentation. 
Um, it's always great to capture it, whether it's right now, whether it's you know 10 minutes from now, or even if things come up over the course in between, you need, you need to share information. And Caroline, if you want to go to the next slide. So really what we've been doing as an organization has been involving from almost like a top-down transformation project governance model to being a little bit more broader. You can see that really occurred over the last few board meetings where we've encouraged the Coalition for Health Improvement leadership members to start joining the conversation. And especially during the board learning sessions, incorporating them into the discussion so that it wasn't just a listen to what the board says, but really how are you helping influence and providing feedback into the discussions we're having at the governing board level. Um, same thing with community members as well. I know there's a few community members that have been on this call that have actively shared some input at the previous governing board meeting. We are really looking again to expand that principle and that idea to the work that we are doing with the strategy work group. And I know Molly shared a little bit of this at one of our previous meetings. But our strategy work group is really expanding to be an board only work group to really include the Co Coalition for Health Improvement leaders, as well as some of our community member leaders as well. And so we are actually in the process right now of recruiting new members, both a few in, at board level and as well as in the community level to bring them into the work group. And so the work group focus is also going to shift a little bit. Now that we designed um, the three pillars to really, you can see those top three bullets on the screen, champion, NCACH, our mission, our guiding principles, and the three pillars, and champion that across the community, right? We spent as a board and as an organization a year and a half really getting ourselves centered and focused on this, but now we need to do the job of bringing this out to the community, as well as gathering the community's feedback to learn how we can adjust and grow as an organization. This isn't, again, something that we want to tell North Central Washington, this is what we're doing. You can come aboard or not, but really, you know, tell them where we've come in our journey and have them join us in that journey and help shape this work moving forward. I um, mean, so again, that includes connecting across differences, organizations, and roles, knowing that as we look at how we build out and bring the three pillars to life, there's going to potentially be some tough just conversations in there. I think the key example for me is that we have a pull over shared um, data measurement. And what we do know is that NCACH um, is not, you know, the end all be all for data, but we have a lot of key partners in there, including public health, including hospitals, and including other community organizations. that we have to work together to figure out what this anchoring and shared data measurement means, and how do we do it as a community and who's on first for doing that work. Um, and so really looking at the differences of those roles and the different organizations and coming into agreement. And then really center the community needs through new ways of learning and working together. So what we are promoting may sound simple, but in a lot of ways, it can be pretty radical. And so we need to bring the community along and understanding what that work does and growing it. So really, our ultimate goal um, is by the end of the year, we develop an accessible, sustainable community tester, tested version of our three pillars. So we're not expecting to have a plan and a distributed model in April or in June, but really at the end of the year, we'd like to see really something that's more plan oriented or based that we can really say, this is what we're gonna do driving forward into the future. If you go to the next slide, this gives you a little bit of a version of how to do it. And you know, a lot of the ways that, you know, I'll say I myself have been looking at this and I think has been discussed in the strategy work group. It's almost like a, a three-step approach, right? First, we really need to focus on building for an inclusive process of distributed leadership. We can't develop a portfolio until we have the players together in a process that makes sure decision making. And in a way, we can't really anchor ourselves in shared measurement until we have those individuals and those players at the table as well. And so, again, it's really championing those priorities, bringing the people together, 
and understanding how we make shared decisions and how we focus the work together and distribute fashion as a community. And then we focus on how we do that by anchoring in shared measurement. So again, working with our key partners that we bring to the table to figure out how we measure our work, how we measure our priorities and identify those gaps. And this includes both qualitative and quantitative data, which I'll be the first to say, I always get those two mixed up. So I'm not saying again, I am a data expert, but really how we gather both, you know, that hard data, the anecdotal data and the stories about how the work is being achieved. And that really needs to be done through multiple partners. Not one of us can own that. And then really bringing the data and the dis distributed decision-making process together to advance and develop a regional tested port community tested portfolio that we can utilize to drive change in our region. And again, this is really getting to that step is something that we're looking at doing over the course of the year versus something that we are saying that we're gonna be achieving in the next month or two. I think uh, Monte had at uh, one of the initial slides when we had all the different speakers up there, right, to move at the speed of trust. And so what we can do is get in the habit of moving really quickly. And so for us as an organization, we have to remember that sometimes we just need to slow down. Um, it's more important to do it right than to do it quickly and we have time to do this work. And if you can move on to the next slide and surely I believe this is yours. Yeah, so um, in this bridge year, you, you all have seen these goals and objectives. And, um, you know, staff, we took the new mission statement that you all adopted in October 2020, and we looked at ways to leverage and build on the Medicaid transformation work. And we arrived at these, these objectives. Um, so throughout the year, we're going to make day to day decisions and take actions to meet these objectives. And the, those are like the really practical implications of the work that we're gonna we're gonna test ideas this year. And actually, one of the things that's really cool is because we're seeing the writing on the wall with distributed leadership, we're already testing ways to um, work with our community partners and create kind of um, processes that invite people in to identifying solutions. So let me give you a concrete example of that. The, the behavioral health work group that um, Wendy is convening is a perfect example of like a participatory process where she's invited anyone and everyone who cares about the behavioral health system in central Washington. And they're coming together to make sense of the gaps and to figure out how to pri prioritize solutions. So it's really community driven. And I'm so excited to, to hear how that process goes. Wendy's worked really hard on um, building like a space where people are gonna be able to shape the decisions, shape the priorities, shape the investments, which is really great. And I think to a certain extent, we did that with work groups in the past, but not, not like this. So how we do things is already starting to shift in this bridge year this year. Also, I would say that um, as I've been partnering with the Coalitions for Health Improvement um, and specifically the Chai Leads, it's been really fun to explore how we can use this bridge year in 2022 to let Chai make decisions, let them decide what their priorities are, and then give them total discretion to make investments. So that's kind of like that seeding control and distributing the decisions across our network. So we're already kind of testing this and we'll look forward to bringing things back to the board this year as we learn about what works, what doesn't, what's difficult. And hopefully that can help shape how, how we think of our model going forward, both our decision-making model and our investment model and our engagement model. So I'll leave it at that for our 2022 goals. And I think John, you have the Next slide. Yeah, and, and so as we're really building out that future state and we are getting our 2022 goals under speed and going as well, one of the things, again, and I think Ken referenced this a little bit as well, is looking at our government governing board and how we govern as an organization as well. Um, so I'll just 
bring you guys back to six months ago for those board members who were here. We actually had a presentation from Mike Bonetto from Tenfold Health. Um, and Mike helped us, he helped, he helped us when we were going through the acting executive director work. Uh, and he also helped us a little bit as internally as we've looked at how we shape governance models for the organization. And so he spent some time talking about different governance models for a board. Um, one that's operationally focused to all the way other level to one that was focused on really policy governance as a whole. Um, and so really, as we've been shifting and we've build, been building out our three pillars, we've, without really knowing it, been having a lot of shifting and changes in how we operate as a governing board as well. And so really in the early days of the Medicaid transformation project, we were, we were a pretty operational board. Um, the board was the only individuals doing this work at the start of the ACH. And so we were both the board and somewhat the staff. I actually think, I think Kathy turned out, nope, Kathy has her camera on there. I think Kathy was actually supporting at a staff level at, at one point in the early, early days, if I'm correct, right, Kathy? You're shaking. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, you may have been our first ACH type staff person before Linda and I, if I were, if I was to be honest. I can't take that credit. Um, and so the board really started there. And then as we've gotten our feet under ourselves, we've slowly shifted to a policy board without really, you know, defining ourselves as a policy board. And to be honest, we're not really a strict policy board as well. We're somewhere between operations and policy in the way we function. And then as we've been exploring distributed leadership and distributed decision-making and governance, that also is influencing, you know, how we look um, as a board and look really to try through roles and the function of it. So again, we're really moving away from a board that's been focused on operations to a board that's really focused on providing leadership and guidance to our community on our mission, on our three pillars, and how we as a community are gonna live and achieve that together. Because again, we're also moving away from NCACH, you know, being seen as the group that's doing the work to us as a community coming together for a regional portfolio. And our role is just to help steward that process. So the board as well is shifting in that notion. And even Ken earlier, when we were having nominating committee conversations, recognize, it, recognize that as well as, you know, A, more community members are interested in joining our boards. So we have to look at how we continue to engage community members and get broader input in the work that we're doing. And also, you know, even for those who are interested, there are multiple ways to engage in this work. Um, and contribute to the decision-making process. That doesn't always mean they have to have a seat on the board. Um, and being a steward sometimes means that some of the key decisions that people may be interested in may not occur at the board level anymore at this point. So there are other ways we'll want to include them in the work. Um, so those, that's, again, that's a conversation I think as we're building out really making the pillars actionable that this year. One thing we'll probably also want to be sure when we land at the end of this year is what kind of governance are we functioning under and how does that influence the makeup of the board and how decisions and how work is getting done at the board. Um, and we'll see that evolve over the course of the year. Again, I'll say that's not something we're deciding next month, but something that we'll take the time to have thoughtful conversation on. And then we'll move to the next slide. And I think Caroline. Yeah, the perfect segue, John. Because <laughs> if you're wondering what to expect during this bridge year, um, here's some things that we, we thought we would share. So by the July retreat, um, we're really hoping to spend the next four months really deepening partner relationships, having you join the partner convenings, expanding understanding of regional context, again, through partner convenings and also board learning that we're going to bring back at future meetings. And then um, having some initial ideas for the for end statements. And Monty is gonna help us in a little bit understand what we mean by these end statements. So what we have time through July to kind of make sense of what those might look like. But by the end of this year, as John alluded, we would have a clearer sense of not just the end statements, but also the board's role. 
Um, so we've been talking about maybe a difference between between being stewards and what the board, how the board was functioning before. Well, by the end of this year, instead of you sitting here thinking like, huh, that's vague, that's confusing, I'm not sure I really get it. By the end of this year, hopefully all of you get like, I now understand what it means to be a steward. And I understand what that means in terms of the, the shift in what how our board operates. Um, and then along with that, we would also have a plan for recruiting additional board members. So there's nothing that's getting like turned upside down. It's not like the game board is getting flipped up this year. We're just taking the time to think about it and be deliberate and understand what the shift means and then planning for that going into 2023. Um, Monty, I think you have a little bit more context about what these end statements might look like. Can you help us make sense of that? You bet. Um... Well, I'll do my best. <laughs> so, um, as it sounds like some of you were there for the tenfold health conversation, and um, in one sense, this is like at a upper level, really simple and straightforward. I mean, the the benefits of moving to this type of policy governance model is to avoid the two challenges that all boards tend to have: is either micromanaging things that they don't have time to micromanage very well or rubber stamping things uh, at the cost of not being, you know, fulfilling their legal and moral obligation as good stewards to a really important organization like this ACH. So um, this model, which I've been trained on, has been a long time. I'm not a purist of any models. And I'm not sure how Mike presented it all. He's really sharp. But I think that the thing I really like about this model is that it helps boards to fulfill its responsibility, its fiduciary and other responsibilities uh, for keeping the organization solvent and doing what it's been contracted to do without spending all this time doing that. So it has some really specific mechanisms for doing that and they're more on the executive limitations policies. And then on the other side of this, as some of you may recall, Mike probably shared this with you, is saying that most of the board energy should be going to, again, I'm gonna, because John's throwing this out a couple times, as stewards, um, to best understand who they're owning this organization, this asset, this benefit from, on the case of a much larger group of stakeholders, and to really understand through them and with one voice as a board, what are really our desired results? You know, what does success look like? You know, and what detail do we want? How specific do we want to say that that looks before we hand it over to the staff to execute to do what the staff needs to do? So I, I often will say what results for whom at what relative priority or cost, which is similar to what Mike has on this particular slide. And it is really a big shift because it means less time kind of more internal uh, focused and more time theoretically, you know, lots of boards that I've worked with with this type of model are spending more like 60, 70% of its time looking externally to really understand how to weigh in on these questions. This is not like a one and done, we've created end statements. It's constantly saying, are these the right ends? How do we know we're making progress around those things? So um, just a little bit of context to let you under, know where I'm coming from as I kind of share, I, I think there's two more slides. I think when you have an organization, a lot of community health centers, for example, way back when we're using a policy governance model and because it's pretty clear what you know, CHCs do, this is an example of what are the results, really improving access to care, um, and, and the board kind of saying, you know, this is what we mean by improving access to care, for whom, um, really defining that based on, you know, income, and not to exceed a certain amount of resources that that particular community health center had, and so not to get lost in the weeds, this is just an example of an end statement for a pretty discreet, well-defined service delivery organization. And that works well. Um, and as you all know, because you've been creating this all along, um, or moving to this transition, as Caroline suggests already with the pillars, already paving the way for some of the things that John described, as a distributed network with a much broader set of aspirations and outcomes, it, you know, there's going to be different types of end statements. It's, it's uh, both an, an interesting new opportunity. And so this next slide, I just put a uh, version, we're doing work with the North Sound ACH. And again, don't worry about getting lost in the words, but it's just an example of like you all, they no longer have just the Medicaid transformation, but CMS 
says they need to be doing that they've been contracted out to do and need to fulfill that obligation. They are now moving out of paint by numbers into what is that canvas, just like you all are around what do we say we really stand for and how are we going to best utilize our resources that we have now and hopefully grow more resources beyond just those that are coming through the state and, and the CMS um, through this wave year. So in their case, this is just an example of their purpose, but this first ends that they, this is just kind of a sample. There's, they're really tasked, the Liz and her team was saying, we wanna make sure we're meeting the urgent needs and reducing barriers to well-being for individuals who are struggling the most. I won't read all those words um, to really dismantle some of these systems and the barriers. This is the language that their group feels comfortable. And I would really stress that I work with a lot of groups. Um, I'm working with a group like now in Wisconsin that this language would not feel comfortable to them even though they would very much agree with the spirit of this. And so whatever the in statements that you all come up with need to be reflective of your broader population. But nonetheless, uh, this really is indicating that they're hoping that Liz and team will really be indicating that they're using resources to identify those that are most str struggling with inequities um, because of barriers to access to health services, but other vital conditions. And then they have another end statement that is really around how they want to prioritize doing that within a distributed network, you know, and not just any network. They go on to define that a network that has a common narrative, a common vision, a common framework for how they work together. And so they're expecting that whatever Liz comes back with over the next couple of years, um, that 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 will be reflected, that she's going to show evidence that that network is starting to use common language, common networks, common uh, narrative by which they're kind of thinking about equity and well-being and that there is increasingly regional investments that are well coordinated. So it will be incumbent upon Liz to say, yeah, here's regional investments and look at this coordination between some of the local foundations as well as some of the other state resources or maybe even some rescue to renewal resources through ARPA that are better coordinated because we exist. So this is just an example of how ends in this new world might um, play out for you all um, and the types of things that, that John and team would be coming back to say, hey, we're honoring kind of what you all said right now in a version of your pillars, maybe kind of reworked and with maybe some more specificity that will be up to you before you hand it over to staff to say, we would like you all to figure out how to best execute this. So I know I just shared a lot with you, but hopefully the principles of you know, how putting at the ends in a world where you all are actually in relationship to a much broader set of stakeholders are kind of defining what those priorities are based on results. I'm looking at a number of folks that I am just getting to know and hopefully some of what I'm sharing makes a little bit of sense, at least the spirit of that or others that may have a policy governance approach and you know if there's questions or ideas on that front. Or if that, if those of you who are with, with Mike, does that seem consistent with what he shared? One of the things that I think about um, look, going into this bridge year is the projects and things that we've done in the past as NCACH. Uh, I, I wondered who the players were. I wondered what, you know, how did they come up with this project and all of that, um, that work that went into it. And now I think that this going forward is gonna bring that all to the forefront and be transparent. And we will all be able to see you know, the players and the movers and shakers that are going to be um, moving the needle in healthcare. And uh, so that's what I was just, I wanted to just point out that I was interested and excited about that piece. Thanks for that, Molly. Um, you know, I was, with the North Sand ACH on Friday, they had a board meeting. And um, like you all, they're trying to figure out what is the board role in this new space look like in a distributed network? You know, what is it that is uniquely the boards and when the board member shows up in some other partner convenings or work groups, you know, without just their board hat on, how do we meld those kind of different ways that we're working and learning together much in the way that you all you know, are starting to kind of expand the strategy work group from not just being a, a board 
function or a, 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 an important appendage of the board, but something that is connective tissue across different stakeholder groups. And so I don't know if this is helpful, but I find it really interesting. So they have a resilience fund that's been built up um, over this last period where they have the discretion around how to use that with the North Sound ACH. And John, I know you've talked with Liz a little bit about this. So the question had come up with the board on Friday around what's the board's role in deciding how to use these funds when we say that we want you know, the use of these X millions of dollars that we have control over now, but we really want community voice and we want community priority in that. And yet the, the board has really re financial responsibility. So this type of model um, of a governance model and kind of a distributed leadership model they decided that their role as a board was to really make sure that they were maximizing the return on investment, that they were being good stewards of that, that they were making sure they weren't violating any of the restrictions that had been placed on it from the funder, but that they were going to engage in a process with some guardrails around how to make sure that community voice and partners actually decided how to really maximize that money. And they would like to be part of that process but they knew that the board didn't have the final say in that. They just had the say in what, where the parameters are um, around making sure that that money was managed well. So I think that those types of scenarios, it might be um, ones that you all will continue to both wrestle with. And I think felt really good about the decision that they made and are really excited about more people having influence on how those uh, resources are going um, in their particular region. I think it's going to bring out more communication between all parties and that will bring about storytelling, which is what I love about this kind of work. The stories are compelling and heartwarming and uh, exciting sometimes. So that piece, getting it out to the whole community, not just our small group where we know we do wonderful work, but to, to get it out to everyone and elevate it. It's just, um, I think, a, a good purpose for this board, so. Yeah. So John and Caroline, again, I'm, I'm watching the chat. I don't know if we um, were still wanted to move into thinking about thriving or a little bit of some content. Um, sure, do you want me to start sharing those slides? Yeah. You know, can I, can I ask quickly, I'm gonna, Check on those who were in the governance committee. It seems a long time ago, um, <laughs> but I know it's not. And I see Ramona has a little smirk on her face. Uh, I know that we're all generally used to end statements um, that are more operational focused, especially when you're a, a delivery service delivery provider. How does it? How did some of the ones you see on the screen? How did they resonate with you guys? Or what, what are things that excite you about them? Or what are things that make you nervous when you see a statement like that? Yeah, this is Mike. You know, I think, you know, those end statements are helpful to really show where the agreements are as far as how we're going to collaborate. And having that kind of clarity about what the outcome is, is I think really key because, you know, we, we're now in this, we've shifted a lot of medicine to outcome assessment as opposed to just doing procedures or doing, you know, good delivering care, but actually looking at outcomes and, and, and that's part of the value equation. So as we look at high value care, we really want to know what our targets are. So it really helps to have clarity on those statements. I would agree. I took a just a screenshot of those um, uh, statements to get a better idea and be thinking about how to um, you know, verbalize or put into words our, our ends. So I'm looking forward to that. No, I don't know that I would use the word dismantle in an end statement, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> to each his own. Mm -hmm. And Kat's asking to put them on the screen for a moment. And Caroline, I think you can do that, right? Uh, 
I may know, Kat, while you're looking at that, yeah. I had a chance to present to the R Valley or Future Board on Friday about what we're doing as an ACH. And even like when you look at some of these end statements created, sometimes it's really hard to explain the outcome of what we do as an organization. Um, so having some of these defined always helps, you know, all of us center on some of the, the true tangible components of the work that we do. Um, because a lot of people are used to seeing, I took care of X number of patients, I made X number of visits, and I reduced their, you know, diabetes control to closer to normal. And so a lot of these kinds of end statements are harder to, harder to sometimes grasp because they move a little bit more to the intangible feelings versus like the direct outcome of the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, just as a reminder, Liz took her first crack in December. So John, you and team will, so what do you mean by that your investments, you're thinking about current and future generations? Are you looking at investments that could have impacts, you know, beyond this next quarter that could really change systems that could be felt by generations? So there, there's an iterative process by which either the board would say, you know, we want to make sure that you actually are investing in things that have some either evidence base or promise that they are not just kind of short-term investments. Um, and so these words are still pretty high level, but as you go back and forth to say, the, as the executive reports, like how well are we doing on those? We start to get in very much more operational definitions. What type of measures are you using to actually frame well-being? Mm -hmm. Um, so just on the other side of this is a much more specific results oriented conversation to Mike's, you know, sentiment as well. I think it's always helpful to have a buy win to just, you know, it can be out in the future, but it gives you a goal to reach for. So it's just not something that stays on the end statement for years when it really needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. And just for the North Sand sake, I just cut and paste. These, this is not all their end statements. They have some much more. I know. Ones that are I, a little was, bit, I was teasing. Was it very nice? <laughs> no, but I think your point is no, for sure. Well taken. And I don't put these up as a, an example of um, that they've done it all right. I just wanted to give you a flavor of one that's probably closer to what you all are doing. Well, it's good. Uh, there are times when there are really urgent needs and there are times when things need to be dismantled to you know, I, I, I think maybe calling it out is a brave thing to do. Kat, go ahead, I see your hand up. Sure, I just was gonna say, I think this is where from the space of sort of measurement, one of the things that we've been pushing ourselves to do is uh, in that space of where stories matter and really the um, qualitative information is important to um, help uh, perhaps fill gaps where qualitative information is not, or quantitative information, excuse me, is not able to um, be had. And so I think it's just where the, in setting some of those end statements, how can we consider where are there opportunities where stories and qualitative information and data can, that we can ensure that we're valuing that in addition to more quantitative data, which I think we tend to lean towards as well. Monty, do you want to share some of the Thriving Together framework? Because I think it, it provides a really interesting way to think about quantitative measures of these really big macro um, concepts of like, what does it mean to thrive? How do we measure that? <laughs> yeah. Sure, I'm happy to jump in. And you can notice that um, North Sound, like a lot of other groups, are you know looking at thriving, not just as a intuitive positive way of thinking about their aims, but they're, it's really measurable. I don't think this slide deck goes into deep measurement, but I can allude to that. And this maybe just give you a flavor around some of the thriving together work. And I can, again, offer this up as if there's deeper interests of kind of thinking about how it might adopt this. So thriving together, um, as you, some of you may know, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's good, you can start there. Uh, a few of us got phone calls actually from the federal government in the early stages of COVID to ask us to think about how we could engage kind of leading non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations around the country to see how they might be seen and responding to the compounding crisis that we're facing our communities and our country. 
that later we started to call that the springboard. Um, and I'll share a little more of that. And on a parallel track has been the federal government, the federal plan that for uh, long-term recovery and resilience. Sorry, Mati, I'm pressing the wrong buttons. That's okay. Wait, That's and okay. tell me which That's side fine. I should be on That's and good. then say next slide. That's good, otherwise. okay, perfect. <laughs> but it's probably worth noting so that the federal uh, long-term recovery and resilience group that basically is looking at not just the immediate response to what communities are facing on a number of different fronts right now, but what are the long-term plans and investments? Um, and this is now 30 interagencies from HRSA and HUD and SAMHSA, CMS, um, all are looking at how they build this and they built the foundation framework based on this thriving together piece that is a bridging framework for them. And it will impact measurement and investments and policies and how the federal government will relate to states and communities. So in that sense, it's it, we weren't sure exactly if it would get used or not, but it is being used as a driving document and, and process for that. So on this next slide, um, for those of you who, who may or may not know that thriving is a very strong social science indicator that's been measured for a couple of decades and Gallup has been measured around the world. So it's one that is sensitive and cuts across cultures and so looking at thriving in relationship to who's thriving, who's suffering, who's struggling, and that's based on Cantrell's ladder question, which is really, you know, where would you place yourself on best possible life on a scale of zero to 10? And where would you place now? And where would you place it five years from now? So that simple self-report reflection is a very, very powerful indicator on a bunch of fronts. So we have looked at using thriving, that kind of sense of how we feel fun think and function as one measure, not the only, uh, to Kat's point. I mean, there's quality and, and John's, there's qualitative and quantitative, but we use that as kind of our driving force for kind of asking this question of how might we respond given the current service situation in our country and our communities to bring us not just to the status quo, to, to build resilience, to bring up thriving. And it became kind of all people in all places thriving, no exception, which is on the next slide. Um, kind of where we started and that was you know with an in inquiry you know how can we convert loss into renewal and we started with the premise of how do we really think about the immense reservoir of resilience that's embedded that's either being activated or could be activated in our communities to really help us organize around local and you know, nationwide action around this unifying measurable expectation as you can see all places all people in all places thriving no exception um, Next slide, please. And this is, I'd forgotten this slide was in there, but this is just kind of a little bit of a tip off to measurement for, for later on. So well-being, you can be seen and it can also be measured by those personal, and that's like the Cantrell's ladders. There's some other measures that we use a number of open source well-being surveys. And well-being, as many of you know, is a construct that's growing in popularity. It's you know, I think our team for the last 20 years, always, if we talk about health, we always say health and well-being because no matter what, health is almost always narrowly defined in our own minds, even though the World Health Organization for 30 years has talked about this broad notion of health, we well-being tends to kind of broaden that out. And so well-being really looks at our mental, physical, social, spiritual, financial well-being, all the dimensions. And as you all are talking about whole people, whole care, whole community well-being, it could be a really nice way of thinking about that, not just in languaging and stories, but also in the ways that we're measuring well-being. Um, and so, the, you know, so one the other way, I'll just quickly, sorry about that. Um, there are these urgent services. So one way that we're looking at well-being in the country, and when I say we, it's a little bit of a royal we, but folks that are the leading measurement folks, one of our partners, I know you met Jane Erickson, but the Rethink Health, Bobby Milstein, who is a leading expert on kind of well-being, was in charge of syndemics and social determinants of health at the CDC for a long time. Now he's um, at the Ripple Foundation Rethink is he and a lot of other folks, National Academy of Medicine have been really thinking about the vital conditions of well-being. And so we're looking at the combination of what are the urgent services and vital conditions as part of our environment. And I realize I'm speaking pretty fast because I think we can follow up with some material, but just know that this, there's some really interesting innovations in measurement right now around how we can measure these pieces. And so since I've touched on the vital conditions, I think this next slide um, is, was there another one before that? Or was it after that? Maybe I, 
No, okay, that's okay if you can go back up. Um, so these are the seven vital conditions that have a lot of overlap with the social determinants of health. And social determinants of health is, is good. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. We find this, and again, the folks that created this where folks have been leading a lot of the social determinants of health work is a little bit easier way for talking about um, and framed in a way that is easier for communities and other partners that aren't part of health and human services and public health in some ways. We tend to look at these with both lenses, but these vital conditions are things that all people, no matter where they are in their life course, no matter where they in the globe, need on a regular basis to thrive. So, um, and underneath these are a lot more detail and metrics, and those types of things, but just as a quick glance, you know, thriving natural world, as we know, and I know that there's been some challenges all over the country and up in your neck of the woods too, just around not just sustainable resources, but actually kind of freedom from harm from natural disasters. Um, so there's the thriving natural environment that obviously plays a key role. There's the basic needs for health and safety. And then that includes things like, you know, routine uh, physical and mental health, uh, food, um, freedom from harm, addiction, trauma, um, and kind of basic public health infrastructure, all kind of, that's what this one is composed of. Um, and then humane housing, you know, again, that is, is really straightforward, the type of housing that is affordable, reliable, um, safe in, in all different ways. Meaningful work and wealth really gets at not only having family sustaining wages, but a sense of dignity and purpose in our work. You know, lifelong learning includes the first thousand days of life, but also talks about the emotional support, trauma free, you know, the trauma-informed approaches and to uh, K through 12 and the, the emotional well-being in K through 12, as well as lifelong learning, whether one pursues or has an opportunity to go to college or other paths, um, seeing that. So there's a number of strategies and indicators around that vital condition, reliable transportation, same thing, the type of transportation that we can count on, that we actually have access to the things that we need or desire. And then this last one I'll double click on because it's really animates all the others. It's a vital condition, but also plays a really special role, which is our belonging and all of the work and research that we know has been going on, but particularly in the last few years about how important belonging is to our well-being. And some of you had access, you know, were exposed to some of the work of John Powell, this notion that belonging is a co-creation process and that it also is our civic muscle, our ability of our communities, your chais, the regions to be able to actually affect their destiny in some ways. So this, this is a vital condition that influences our well-being. And so as this kind of visual graphic shares with you, thriving, suffering, and struggling is really one way that we start. And the question is, what are those wraparound vital conditions that allow us to boost thriving and reduce suffering and struggling? And there's a lot going on in this slide, but just to state the obvious, when we are impacted by adversity, like you know, an economic downturn or a crisis that is, you know, precipitated by a natural disaster or a global pandemic, we have demand for urgent services. And so that's why this, how do we, how do we make sure that we're attending to that and doing that with care, you know, to, to quote Wade, Wade, to do it with actually even love, you know, systems and relationships, but to not build an adversity economy, to not build you know, how do we start to move people back to the vital condition? So that's a lot of what Thriving Together is about that um, many partners are working on. And I won't go into these kind of renewal areas just to know that our thinking, there's a lot of work around these three areas of our common life, which is our civic life, wh whose voice, a healthy democracy, our economic life, economies that work for everyone. What does that look like? And what does our, our social, emotional, spiritual lives look like? So those are all pieces that we think are really pathways to kind of thriving together. So that's a lot in a nutshell, but maybe it whets your appetite for, this is not just a, here's a list of social determinants or another framework like County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, which is great in partners, but there is a larger, a larger narrative, if you will, and only even a theory of change. And one thing I didn't point out is legacies. So these legacies are the things that we've inherited since the beginning of our country. And we know that some of those legacies are about dignity and inclusion and innovation and all the goodness that has come through, you know, many things that we've done together, advancements in human and civil rights. Um, there's legacies that any 
you know, within the North Central for sure. And we have legacies of exclusion and harm that date back to the inception of our country. And the idea is how do we make sure that we are thinking about the legacies that we've inherited from our ancestors as we're thinking about strategies and recognizing that we can create new legacies. And Monty, we're at time. I know there were a few, a few more oh. slides, but um, I think, like you said, we're going to come back to this this yep. model, and we're, it's something something we're going to share with our partners as well at the partner convening. So right. you'll hear more about it. And um, I I don't know if there's any last minute stuff, Monty or John, that you want to kind of wrap this session up with before we yep. head into the telehealth fund. Yeah. I can see comments that people like this framework, it resonates. And I, for me, it, I think one board member, it might've been Jesus that a prior board member mentioned that it would be helpful to have a framework to come around. Like the pillars are one thing, the pillars kind of talk about how we're gonna work together to figure out priorities and make investments. But how do we, what's the thing that we can have, the shared language we can have and a framework where we all can make sense of things? Like what does health and well-being mean? Where do we want to prioritize? So this yeah. is one potential framework to use and um, there'll be more yeah, to come, right? Yeah, and I'll, uh, thank you. I apologize for not totally paying attention or time and over the hard stops. So, so I think that's right. We can pick this up. And the nice thing about the thriving together is the federal government is a lot of their work. I was gonna say the social impact exchange, a lot of social impact investors, including large foundations, see this as not the only framework, but they see it as a bridging framework. And we have some leading metrics around this that we can kind of share and they can live side by side with more traditional social determinant metrics or with disease burden metrics. And so we can kind of show you that. The nice thing is that there is a stewardship piece around this that I think is very, what is what are the practices of stewardship in a distributed leadership network that you all could figure out how to make your own um, as you're moving into this space? So I would be delighted if there's parts of this that you find useful and happy to share more, um, but grateful for a little bit of time with you all today. And congratulations on kind of starting this new year and all the work that you've done to date to get it here. And I see Ramona, you put in the chat that this resonates with you. And I think for a lot of people, when you look at these vital conditions, especially those who have been trying to um, do improvement work in clinical settings, these are a lot of things that are really the, the crux of what's keeping individuals from being healthy mm -hmm. and, and really thriving. So again, these are the things we can we, we need to come together as a community to help thrive. Mm -hmm. Fairly much effect is a framework of how we start moving that direction and how we start adding some focus. And we may tweak it a little bit here and there, but it gives us a sense of how to start engaging with people. I promise it'll be the last thing I say, but I just wanted to point out that the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that many of you know are partners on this vital condition. They contributed this, the Wellbeing Trust, a lot of the leaders in mental and behavioral health, and they are adapting this in other pieces. And I'll send some of that. Um, that might kind of, as you're make, making the Medicaid transformation. So. And then Molly, I think we can wrap it up there and over to you to move on to the next one. Yes, yes, and I do. And, and I just want to say that I love the word thriving and that piece. It's just um, so much better than social determinants of health. I, it just, it's so much more. So I'm excited about the next, next trainings. Uh, but now we have Wendy with our telehealth. So Wendy, go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring back, um, if you just a little quick uh, historical on this for those of you who may not have been with, um, with us, when COVID hit, we decided to look into some telehealth, um, what can we as an ACH do to support telehealth? And after much boarded discussion, we decided to put an RFP to really look at a telehealth community within our clinical partners, um, as, well, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as what can we do in the community. Um, that RFP went out, we gave it um, to two different organizations. WSU has taken over the community part and Ingenium did the clinical maturity. Um, we had hoped to have this wrapped up by uh, the fall last year, but as we all know that COVID has incurred a lot of um, work that wanted, we wanted to do um, just because clinical partners just didn't have the capacity. And instead of just shutting it down and holding true to our timeline, we expanded it out to give our partners um, the true opportunity to participate. And so, um, We've come to this point today where uh, we feel like we have enough information that we can bring back to you as a board. Um, 
and for you to start to ponder and we can start to think about next steps. So um, Christian and Kathy from Ingenio will give you a broad overview of the agencies that they've met with, um, the process that they have gone through, as well as recommendations um, that they have for this board um, moving forward. We're not asking for any approvals um, today, so we're not asking for any board decisions, um, but we will be giving you a lot of meat to chew on, um, and we really would like your fee feedback to help us shape how we move this board. And just a reminder, this is for the clinical partners only. Next month, we'll be talking about the community um, assessments with WSU. So this is the clinical partners only. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christian and Kathy, and they can introduce themselves. Sounds good. Making sure my video and uh, audio is unmuted. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to meet with all of you. We've spent a lot of time in your area virtually. <laughs> um, uh, both Kathy and I are here on, on the East Coast. And so uh, and, and, and it's great to have reached this milestone here. As uh, Wendy said, we were very optimistic and moving forward um, with the assessments and then Delta hit and response times from the clinic that we worked with uh, getting slower and slower. And so but uh, we stayed the course. And here we are today with, a, I think, a really insightful uh, report that was uh, very helpful to summarize. Uh, my name is Chris Malaster. I'm the CEO and founder of Ingenium uh, Digital Health Advisors. Uh, Hale, originally from Germany, if you're picking up an accent, uh, born, raised and educated there, trained as an engineer. Um, got introduced to healthcare at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, lived uh, in rural Minnesota for uh, quite a number of years and, and now reside uh, on the East Coast outside of uh, Maryland. And uh, with that, I'd also like to introduce here Kathy Latender, who's been uh, uh, with me on this process the whole time as well. Great. Thanks. I'm Kathy Latender, and I'm here in snowy Vermont. Um, I've spent most of my career as a healthcare administrator um, in different healthcare organizations. My specialty is organizational excellence, really helping organizations, um, healthcare delivery organizations, set a vision and achieve and implement that vision. In the context of this um, project, my role has been as the client excellence manager, working with um, each of the member organizations to ensure a really great assessment process. Um, and uh, great uh, findings. And so I've been involved at each and every step in the process. And Christian will be uh, largely sharing with you our findings, but we are both available for Q&A as we get to that part. Sounds very good. Thank you very much, Kathy. And with that, I'm uh, sharing my screen here. Um, also, if uh, I, I saw Rosalinda uh, on camera uh, earlier, um, uh, Rosalind and Jesus, if you're available, um, I asked uh, if you could uh, maybe uh, say say a few words here. Um, uh, that would be very helpful. Jesus, you were the first to un uh, unmute here, so thank you very much. Uh, Jesus and his organizations uh, um, were together with Rosalind and one of the first sets of organizations that uh, went through the telehealth assessment. And Jesus, if you could just share a few words on your experience and kind of what you gained from it. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Christian. Uh, well, um, you know, this was an opportunity for us to uh, become a little bit more involved and um, share um, a lot of information about our organization with an external party that had the potential to help us assess and um, our opportunities for improving the use of, of, of technology in the delivery of healthcare. I would say that it's not easy, um, or, it's, or it's not it's not common to uh, for health systems to to share as much information as it was being requested. So there is a a, a, a tendency to to uh, to be just resistant to that ask. Uh, but we took a chance and shared quite a bit of information with with this group, um, and uh, it, it resulted in engaging a lot of our staff uh, from different departments. Uh, including clinicians uh, in order to provide really uh, uh, a good degree of uh, information uh, with depth into the organization so that they could really generate uh, a solution or, or, uh, or recommendations that really uh, had the opportunity to really have an impact. Um, so I was pretty impressed at the, at the result uh, when they came back and, and, and after they took all the information we, we provided them and Worked through it and processed it, and um, they came back with uh, a lot of a lot of good insight that um, we definitely uh, are using 
as we move forward with improving the use of virtual care, um, hybrid care. Um, so for us, it was a very positive experience. Um, and uh, I feel like apolog apologizing for Christian because I was so hesitant to provide you a lot of information that you were asking in the beginning. <laughs> it's all, all good. Uh, uh, Wendy teed us up here perfectly by, by protecting uh, confidentiality. And I think we demonstrated that we're definitely capable. We understand uh, there are competitive environments, especially uh, in, in, in your situation. And yes, we are very respectful of that. And uh, we want to help everybody to get good access to information. Seems like Rosalinda is uh, teed up in some uh, in, in, in another commitment. So uh, uh, maybe, maybe she'll have a chance later. So with that, I um, want to go into the agenda here. Uh, also want to be respectful of our time here. Um, um, this uh, slide deck here has been sent out to you. Um, and uh, oh, actually, there's Rosalinda. Uh, Ro Ro Rosalinda, would, would you be still be available to uh, say a few words about your experience in doing the assessment? Oh, sorry, I had to step away really quick. Not a problem. We're just really thankful for the opportunity to do this assessment with such a talented team. We really felt like um, um, it, they made it so easy, something that we don't know much about. Um, they've really helped us to define a lot of things, to talk through things in our organization. We're already kind of doing so much and how do you get to the next level? Um, and Genium's really been, this has really been a great process for us. And we're really looking forward to um, our action plan that we just built and are getting going and things like that. So we're excited for everything we can be doing here for telehealth for our community. Thank you, Christian, you and your great. team. Well, thank you, Rosalina. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good. Without further ado, then here, um, as Wendy was saying, we're moving into uh, um, the overview here. We'll talk about the organizations that we've interacted with. Um, we then um, talk about the process that we've used to do an assessment with the various organizations, uh, talk about our findings and kind of generic recommendations. As we said, uh, our process was uh, uh, to be uh, hold the information in confidence. And so we just share some generic recommendations that apply to some of uh, uh, the uh, organizations or multiple organizations. And then really towards here, um, uh, the, 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 the second half is really um, providing some insights into the recommendations, because that was, uh, from what we understand, the history here is like, okay, a year and a half ago, I think you started in October 2020 is to, to assess, okay, what should we be doing about telehealth and telemedicine? Should we go right into solutions? Should we go do an assessment? And you went for an assessment. And so um, we're now coming back with very well-informed solutions and services and centralized things that can be set up in the area to support all of the NCACH uh, organizations here. And then we can talk at the end here about next steps. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat. If there's something that uh, pops up in your mind, uh, feel free to uh, uh, put it there. Um, Kathy may respond if we have a quick answer uh, asynchronously here, um, but uh, definitely um, want to open it up for a dialogue uh, later on as well. Um, so we've worked with a number of organizations here, gotten to uh, be very familiar. I was strongly said, I've done a lot of flyovers on Google Earth <laughs> about your, your area and your region, just to trying to get a feel for how long does it take from Tomac to actually get to Wenatchee. So <laughs> it's quite a drive. I can uh, definitely imagine having lived in rural Minnesota where everything is uh, 45 minutes away, uh, even the nearest stoplight, um, I can uh, relate to, to the uh, experience. Although um, it looks more beautiful where you are than, than the, the flat Minnesota um, that I drove through oftentimes. Um, so we had a, a good mix here on the previous slide of, of critical access hospitals, rural health clinics, um, health centers, uh, behavioral health organizations. And we just uh, kicked off uh, uh, um, also working with Renew here with Dell um, uh, as, as well, who uh, finally felt that they had the bandwidth to uh, accommodate our request for information, as Hazel <laughs> pointed out, where we're, we're looking at quite some a little bit of information so we can make educated recommendations. Um, the team we put together here, multi-talented, multi-disciplined team that we brought to, to the process. And then our process was uh, largely interview and survey based. Um, and so, and that's what was needed and gave us really good information. We did a leadership interview and executive team interview, really talking to the whole C-suite and the leadership teams 
uh, did one-on-one -on -one interviews with those uh, leaders uh, that were interested in uh, engaging with us further. Um, we oftentimes also met with the clinicians. We did a clinician survey of uh, 30, 33 questions, which I'll share a little bit about later. Um, we did a telehealth maturity assessment, which I'll also share in a minute to just get a starting point as to what is the maturity of an organization when it comes to telehealth, because that informs as to what are the best next action, action steps that an organization can take. Um, then we went into the analysis uh, internally here, discussing uh, our findings and our insights, and then presented that back into a presentation on findings and uh, recommendations, uh, the structure of which you will see here in, in the next part of the presentation. Um, so the final deliverables, or to look at this uh, differently, is that on the NCHH member level here on the left side, the blue, um, we gave them um, some ideas on a telehealth vision, on alignment with our organization strategy, um, talked about some strategic guidance and the telehealth maturity roadmap of services. And now today we're reporting back out kind of uh, what, what are their strategic priorities of the different members? What are the support needs for uh, growing the adoption and the maturity of the telehealth programs? And what are some uh, suggestions here for centralized support services? And, um, and then in, in the next phase, that once we've narrowed it down, um, what is actually that ask? What, what is that budget that is needed to establish these kind of centralized support services? Looking then um, actually uh, at, at the findings and recommendations, uh, it came across a number of different areas. We assessed uh, each organization's telehealth maturity. We gave them input on what a telehealth strategy could look like for them. We uh, uh, played back the insights we gained from the clinician survey. Uh, we gave them some uh, ideas on uh, six plus uh, areas on strategic guidance. Uh, including a telehealth roadmap, and then discussed on um, what the next steps were. Um, I've talked about this maturity model uh, uh, quite a bit. And so a maturity model just helps an organization to assess where they are, at what level of maturity, so they can decide on what it will take to get to the next level. Um, so it's a model we've developed a, a while back. Uh, starts out with uh, organizations starting at the chaotic or emerging level, uh, moving up to coordinated and supported, and then integrated. And the top two levels, which are really uh, where a lot of the uh, great value lies, then is the strategic and transformative level. Um, we have broken this down. The assessment comes from assessing uh, 10 different dimensions. Uh, they're around the number of services and specialties and the growth trajectory. Um, they look at behind the scenes, uh, what kind of level of coordination, technical and operational support, as well as launch support is available, how much is leadership involved, and to what extent do you have governance over telehealth, and then ultimately the, the vitality, the, the, the thriving of a telehealth program, and obviously all these dimensions here are interrelated. And so then we just uh, did an assessment on those different seven, seven levels from zero to six and the different uh, dimensions here. Um, and for each organization, then built this little profile and then assess that, okay, this organization probably is at that integrated level. Uh, they've already dipped into some of the strategic and uh, transformative uh, hallmarks, um, but also have some other aspects to improve. Um, and the next slide here then shows what that looks like across the organizations that we've assessed. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a spread from uh, organizations that are barely out of the chaotic phase of uh, leveraging and integrating telehealth and telemedicine, uh, all the way to uh, uh, one organization that uh, is uh, really tapping into telehealth as a strategic tool. Um, and if you map those out then again uh, across this, a maturity model here, you, you see the clustering around the emerging and coordinated um, and then uh, moving in into this uh, area. The next three, four slides are very text heavy. I'll defer to you to read them and study them if you want to know a little bit more, but I just wanted to create it. Um, and what we did for these organizations is then to explain, okay, you're at the, um, you already mastered the supportive level. So going with the example that I mentioned earlier, um, so these are the hallmarks of things that you already are doing. Um, the next goal for you really is, or where you're at, is actually at the integrated level. So you're integrated, patients have multiple services, you use generated health data. Um, and then the next level is really then strategic. And that's why this maturity model is so helpful. 
is because when you get to the strategic or the transformative levels, telehealth can really help to move your strategic objectives in an organization forward, whether it's expansion in geographic areas or addressing social determinants of health or better access, care continuity, patient-centered model home, whole person care, whatever the objectives that you are pursuing, uh, telehealth is one opportunity, one tool in your toolkit to, in order to advance your strategic objectives and then the most mature organizations here in the U.S. Uh, are really reinventing the relationship of uh, with their patients, the, the ability to deliver care at a distance and, and really transforming themselves towards a, uh, a very virtual uh, organization that, that can serve patients in multiple different ways, um, um, not just in the in-person care environment. And so that's kind of the roadmap where a lot of organizations are moving toward. We then shared a survey insights. I just have, a, I brought a few slides here just to see that. So we, for example, had one organization um, saying, uh, well, the biggest barriers for us are technology challenges or lower and no reimbursement or low patient engagement and interest. So we saw a spectrum here of different answers. The other thing that we played back to these organizations is, well, how are you faring across, um, on, on those evaluations here with your organizations on the national level? Um, we have access to national data that was aligned with the survey that we administered here. Um, the rural is the light um, blue here, the third line. Um, and so now we were able to see um, in terms of the priorities, how are they doing? So for example, this organization, uh, the clinicians felt that there was low patient engagement and interest. Uh, well, it didn't even make it to uh, the top five, to uh, top eight uh, um, data points here of, on the national survey. Um, and we, we have a, some insights as to why, why that perception is out there of a low interest. Um, and so, so that's just one way how we could provide some feedback and also acknowledge, okay, these are the challenges that we have. And, and obviously technology challenges for my patients and low interest could be somewhat related um, and in, inter interlinked and intertwined. Um, and so, but that was one uh, approach we did. We also then asked uh, what types of resources would be helpful. So in, in, inside of the uh, report out here today, um, what help do you need in order to take telehealth to the next level? And so this organization, for example, said team-based care approach, clarity on reimbursement, clinical training and virtual physical exams. So those are some aspects. Other organizations then said, well, we need some workflow refinement or training or how to do group classes. Um, so this was a behavioral health organization. And so um, there we saw the different needs uh, out there um, that we then reflected in the recommendations of what centralized resources and training and expertise um, uh, organizations are looking for so that they can, in their organization, take telehealth to the next level. So after the survey, then we moved into strategy. As I mentioned earlier, telehealth is a strategic tool that really can help an organization to move uh, um, uh, any, uh, any objectives of your overall organizational strategy forward. Um, we first made a case for why a strategy is important. It provides clarity, prioritizes projects, helps to allocate resources like any good um, valuable strategy does. And then we provided some specific and concrete feedback um, around the different elements of strategy. Um, the, there was a great degree of maturity with regards to organizations having actually a uh, overall organizational strategy. A lot of organizations, it was in development or, or, or in flux. And so uh, we just provided for some organizations some generic feedback or for some organizations that shared with us their strategic priorities, we gave them very specific ideas on how telehealth can help them. Um, just listening in here again, a lot of words here um, in these different areas that you can review. But for example, um, with regards to customer service, you can add additional service line that's improved con convenience regarding quality, uh, improved care transitions, improved continuity of care, uh, management of chronic conditions uh, around the culture or talent optimization or in this time of workforce shortage, how do you attract good talent? Um, it's by saying, well, we're embracing the future of uh, healthcare delivery, which is, is, is hybrid, which is in-person care and telehealth. And so at our organization, um, we're, we're taking this seriously. So do you want to work for us? So <laughs> it's always a good <laughs> interview question to position yourself uh, in the rec recruitment. 
Um, and then uh, the three other pillar, common pillars here of a, of a healthcare strategy around financial stewardship. Uh, it has an opportunity to reduce no-shows or to actually fill holes in, in, in the schedule. Um, um, you have um, reduced costs with readmissions if you're in a hospital environment um, um, or optimize facility space, uh, offer new lines of business, geographic reach and community uh, impact. So telehealth really has an opportunity um, to really impact and affect a lot of the uh, metrics and objectives that an organization cares about. It's not uh, the solution for everything, but it's a contributor to move the needle into the right direction. And that's what we uh, conveyed in, in that section of our assessment. The next six elements then were around strategic guidance. So we provided uh, um, uh, information and education. So we always had two, three slides on what, what does telehealth governance actually mean? What are the responsibilities? Um, and, and then we, we had our recommendations. So the what's here in the orange font, those were kind of some sample uh, uh, recommendations. Um, so for example, designated operational and technical telehealth support, what a lot of organizations are now doing or had already done, um, leverage telehealth optimization expertise, consider a launch methodology. Um, there's different aspects of, um, of, opt, uh, of support that we consider. It's not just the operational and technical support, but also launch and optimization support. And then here are some hallmarks of an optimization leader that one should be looking for in the organization. Uh, or outside to, uh, to, to bring to help with uh, any optimization and standardiz standardization of telehealth. Um, we then moved into telehealth performance measurements. How are you knowing that telehealth is going well? Um, and so we looked at, uh, we provided for uh, all organizations a recommendation on measuring at least these five core metrics here of uh, clinician and patient satisfaction or client satisfaction, the technical performance, visit volumes and reimbursement and then provide it uh, with some additional information uh, around, well, how do you actually set up kind of uh, measurement systems? Um, and so that's the graphic here on the right side. And the fourth area then was around telehealth technology. And so a lot of organizations went with either run of the mill uh, technology like Zoom or Doxy.me. Uh, some organizations shifted towards uh, uh, the EHR provided telehealth and telemedicine uh, solutions. And so here um, some uh, are looking at it, uh, augmenting their uh, offerings with uh, maybe tele-exam capabilities or remote patient monitoring. So all of these elements fall into telehealth. Um, some organizations were looking for some input into uh, how to market it, how to make patients more aware of that the service exists. And then we also provided a lot of organizations a kind of a roadmap of a improvement projects, but also some uh, low hanging fruit or imminent next uh, telemedicine services that they could be launching um, uh, once they were uh, established in their maturity. Um, for example, this is a chart here uh, with nine common uh, virtual care services, starting with what we typically think about when we hear your telehealth, we're thinking about video visits, um, but then also the telephonic care, which was very uh, prominent during COVID, especially when video links were not working, when the video technology was frustrating, um, but then moving up to tele-exams, uh, the whole RPM world, and then all the way here to digital therapeutics. Um, being a very asynchronous, very complex, but uh, an up and coming, especially in the mental health space, digital uh, mental health, digital behavioral health therapeutics are kind of the next frontier, if you will. Um, but they're best introduced when already other telehealth and telemedicine processes are working well and are well supported. And then this slide just summarizes what some of the other organizations that we assessed, what additional guidance came up during the conversations, what, what we recognized, what we realized that was unique to this particular organization. And so I just listed here uh, our titles that we've identified. So um, that's was kind of the report out that we did. And then we circled back with a number of these organizations, but that was during uh, the Omicron, mostly during Omicron uh, or at the tail end of, of Delta. So um, we've, we've uh, re-engaged with a few organizations as, um, offering uh, additional guidance or assistance and now really moving into the stage saying, okay, here's a number of 
uh, centralized or shared or even individual recommendations that we have uh, for all organizations across the NCH CH region here. Um, and uh, so we're going to be circling back here to the organizations with, with a survey, which I'll, I'll share here uh, in a minute. So the telehealth optimization solutions, we kind of divided into five different categories, uh, two of which are more of concern for WSU because they did that community assessment. Um, but these are items that were brought up in some of the interviews, some of the conversations um, that we've had. And that was around some ideas around community partnerships and community infrastructure. I'm very much looking forward to the report from WSU, which syn synced up at the beginning uh, here and there. Um, and so it was interesting to see where they're uh, taking this. Um, the three areas that we focused on uh, predominantly and will focus on today was around the kind of centralized shared resources. What I mean by that, it's a service that can serve multiple organizations. So it's not just one organization that wanted that or needed it or was interested in such a service, but it's something that can be centrally made available and then um, be uh, uh, available for each uh, organization that uh, is, is ready uh, for it. Centralized shared services are kind of in the same vein. You see, when, when we see the examples, uh, it'll become a little bit more clear, and I'm sorry. And then organization-specific support, those were individual specific asks uh, that organizations uh, asked for, but there's also kind of a pattern that emerged. Um, as I mentioned, uh, um, looking forward to WSU's more, more informed uh, recommendations, but didn't want to lose track of the ideas that we did come across here. So obviously, the, 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 the not so uh, invisible elephant in the room, <laughs> the broadband expansion in the rural areas uh, to allow for a reliable connection here. Um, Wi-Fi hotspots um, that have been used successfully, I think, during various parts of uh, um, uh, COVID uh, shared telehealth kiosks and, va and vans that were discussed even, I think, as, as early as two years ago, especially the kiosk idea, um, shared uh, staffed telehealth walk-in clinics in, in maybe abandoned storefronts in rural areas that are open a couple afternoons a week where an MA provides access to telehealth services. Um, and then engaging community health uh, uh, organizations, obviously digital literacy and technology expansion, um, the whole idea about getting uh, patients to use technology, uh, schools, libraries as uh, locations for a remote clinic. Um, and uh, another uh, innovative idea here around uh, building a more accurate map of uh, reception uh, within the rural areas by, people, by, by using an app uh, where somebody could report that uh, uh, receptivity here, reception, uh, or the number of bars is really low, um, so that can be captured with GPS data. So just some ideas that we didn't want to lose track of and to merge with uh, WSU's uh, recommendations. So here are a number of services that we now, um, where we looked at the findings and the recommendations. And as Rosalinda was saying, kind of what is the additional expertise or, or the additional knowledge that is needed to take the, this to the next level to actually implement on the action plans. Um, so one uh, that really um, came up uh, a lot was uh, uh, providing some expertise and education and support for the telehealth coordinators or any named person that provides uh, operational support and maybe also technical support to the telehealth services. And I have more detail on the following slides here. Um, telehealth optimization education support. So one is for the coordinator, one is around this, the general topic of optimization um, through education support or a toolkit, which is a, a, a written resource. Um, uh, website manners training. A lot of the root causes for physicians being hesitant and uh, 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 to use telehealth and telemedicine is that they've never been trained on actually how to look into the camera and just how to effectively use the technology to conduct an exam or to conduct uh, even just a visit and build that rapport uh, with a client. And so just a, a, a quick 15, 20 minute website manners training uh, has shown a tremendous uh, amount of engagement. Uh, I saw it firsthand in an FQHC in, on March 17th, uh, March 20th, um, uh, 2020. 
right <laughs> at the beginning, actually uh, not too far from where Kathy lives, working with an FQHC. And I provide a website manager's training and those clinicians went on to really have um, a, a lot of good experience in delivering telehealth and telemedicine using video. Um, telehealth tech check setup support, another point that addresses the challenges of uh, getting patients to use the technology. Um, and so a quick tech check to, that checks connectivity, technology, digital literacy can really make it totally different uh, between a really dismal experience that's frustrating for the clinician and the patient and, the, and, and having a really great experience or deciding that maybe telehealth is not for this particular patient. Um, it's not the right approach. It's not the right care delivery method. Um, telehealth technology selection support, now that organizations are getting kind of used to telehealth and telemedicine, they're realizing that there's some shortcomings, especially around the workflows or copay collection or, or filling out uh, PHQ-9s or any other, other things that we're so used to in an in-person environment for which there are solutions that exist that have these aspects integrated. So looking at providing support in uh, maybe even standardizing on some technologies or just taking things to the next level or getting more mileage out of uh, the technologies that you may already have. Um, those are some expertise that organizations are looking for. And then the last one in this list here is uh, school-based telehealth launch support. Um, number of organizations looking to uh, offer services in schools um, that also then expands into e exam tools, um, which we'll see here in a minute. And so that's uh, an opportunity to uh, provide maybe some centralized launch support. I think there's some board members here that are from the education system. So uh, rather than reinventing the wheel in every school system, let's just come up with a more standardized approach, more common approach, still individualized for each organization, um, each, each kind of competitive area. Uh, totally understand that, but but giving uh, making it easier for organizations to get started with school-based telehealth, which has its nuances and its uh, 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 challenges as well. So um, set up a, a school-based telehealth system for an FQHC, the same FQHC, and yeah, in terms of workflow synchronization and connection and exams, those are all things that uh, can be solved. Um, th there's some future potential shared resources um, that uh, came up a little bit, but not rose not to the level that we should that we're recommending that the they'll be launched or made available at this point in time. On the right side here, then on the centralized uh, uh, shared services. So you saw the telehealth tech check setup support. That's to set it up for each and every organization. So. Um, but another model, another idea is an innovative idea is to actually have a centralized resource, uh, meaning that somebody is uh, connected to the different HR or scheduling systems of maybe a handful of organizations. And uh, basically it's an outsourced service where somebody with good customer service skills, somebody with the patience to walk patients through um, uh, the difficulties of uh, clicking on a link and opening a text message and <laughs> looking into the camera and getting the right lighting, right? All of that, um, um, having a centralized resource here for the four counties or maybe a couple of resources, depending on the volume. It's another idea and another approach um, to, to, to do that. Um, pre-contracted teleinterpreters and also pre-contracted telespecialists. Um, um, the more patients are getting used to primary care and behavioral health telemedicine, the more they're looking forward to, well, why can't I go over the test results of my cardiology exam um, over uh, the video, right? So, so the ability to access uh, care um, either on the regional level or, or even uh, uh, beyond the regional level, um, just, just having these uh, uh, predefined and, and easy to use. Um, and then uh, two aspects here around standardized uh, remote exam tools and standardized remote physiological monitoring. The idea being behind th these uh, standardizations is that uh, you as a region, as NCSH region, may have more um, negotiation power to negotiate better rates uh, with these vendors. Plus, um, there would be a common pool of shared lessons, uh, of uh, lessons learned, of best practices. And so just if, if everybody in the area and like remote exam tools could be nurse, used in nursing homes or in schools. And so even though if a nursing home is served by multiple of the uh, uh, healthcare organizations in the NCSH region, uh, the nurses may still be using just the same exam tool um, and so standardization brings here some benefit into um, implementing this. 
And then two more items here on the organization specific support. One being that uh, a number of organizations have asked for funds for telehealth equipment and solutions. Uh, obviously those funds could be provided by NCACH, but there's also other uh, grants and opportunities out there that could also be centrally be researched. Like what is the USDA grants that are out there or FCC grants, there's multiple grants for equipment out there that uh, if somebody um, centrally for NCACH keeps an eye out on those and then um, um, looks uh, looks for requests from from the organizations who is interested in that that could be facilitated and I think would be also a very great service to offer. Um, and then the last one is uh, kind of customized telehealth advisor consulting. Oftentimes, when organizations actually get going, we had a call with Rosalind a couple of weeks ago, right? And spontaneously, there were a couple of questions that just came up as they were working through the action plan. So providing access to to expertise, kind of ad hoc for specific unique challenges um, is, is something else that would be valuable. So that kind of pro provides a landscape here. So it's a very rich and very um, uh, broad uh, and, and comprehensive uh, menu of options. Uh, I just want to take a few more minutes here to uh, just highlight a few of these services um, and, and the pattern in which we used to, to, to describe those services. Uh, but before I go there, um, <laughs> I wanted to share, and as I referenced earlier, is that we're going to, now that we have built this kind of catalog of offerings, we're actually going to go out and survey those organizations that we've worked with and ask them, well, how interested are you in those services? We did it a little bit informally with Rosalinda when we had one of those slides up on the screen and she said, yep, yeah, like this, like this, like this, how are you gonna do that? So um, that, was, that was helpful, um, but how interested are you and when do you need these services? And so we're gonna go back and we're gonna ask these organizations. Um, 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 we may even go back to these organizations who currently have not engaged in an assessment because they didn't have the bandwidth, but now can be benefiting from the centralized uh, service offerings as well. So we'll uh, do that, administer that survey and see what results it yields so that we can really invest, that you can invest the funds into those services that are of greatest needs and greatest urgency um, within the community. Before I go into the detail, I wanted to just share, and it kind of was implicitly embedded in the, um, uh, in, in the findings and recommendations that we shared, but I just want to share a, a framework here, which you will see uh, in, in a lot of these services. Um, and it's around the concept that uh, you launch and operate telemedicine services, and then you optimize them, continuous improvement, and then you grow them by adding new services, adding RPM, adding chronic care management, adding digital therapeutics. So there's over the next years, over the next decade, there's gonna be more and more virtual care services that needs need, that will be integrated um, in, into the care delivery spectrum. And so building that capacity of, uh, of evaluating and adopting new technology is very important. Um, as uh, was implicitly um, evident, I think through the findings is that it uh, telehealth covers a lot of different areas. It's uh, about leadership and strategy. It's about rules and regulations. It's about design and support, um, and it's about adoption sustainability. So we have a number of sub bullet items, if you will, here around all the aspects that uh, uh, should and need to need be con considered uh, around uh, launching, optimizing, and growing telemedicine and, and telehealth services. And so this is knowledge that a telehealth coordinator would want to get proficient in. This is knowledge that when you want to do an optimization, um, you would want to um, make sure that you have these things. And that's where kind of the telehealth maturity assessment came from as well. So here's the first service um, that I built with a little bit of an animation. And so we have um, the telehealth coordinator education support. We always started out with a problem statements um, based on our assessment and findings. So in this case, it was many organizations have or would like to establish the role of a telehealth coordinator um, and to provide operational and optimization support, yet have limited resources and or staff with limited expertise. So that was the problem statement. The desired outcome then is that we have knowledgeable telehealth coordinators that are confidently providing effective operational and optimization support to all services within their organization. So that's the desired end state 
Um, the value of this obviously would be that um, there's some knowledge and that the coordinators will enable the organization to establish and to grow and optimize um, a well-performing well set of telehealth services that are clinically efficacious, that are financially sustainable and result in high quality experiences. And then we wrap this up here with the uh, fourth box of describing uh, a number of alternative approaches to this. It's not a kind of one size fits all. Um, there could be a telehealth coordinator launch program, like a, the first 100 days, like the presidential 100, first 100 days. Um, there could be a telehealth coordinator mentoring or coaching or uh, learning cohorts, cohorts, right? So the, um, having multiple organizations that are interested in, in, in learning, bringing the telehealth coordinators, the technical support people together. Um, there could be workshops and education sessions around uh, optimization or workflow design or policy development or technology selection or whatever the challenges are. Um, advisory services, ad hoc advisory services, and then as well as uh, some pre-recorded courses, maybe around uh, website manners training, which was uh, also an explicit uh, element. So this is the pattern we used, problem, desired outcome, what's the value of achieving the desired outcome, and then what approaches are available. As I mentioned earlier, this, the slides were sent to you earlier uh, in, in a PDF, and so you can review these other services um, here and we also use this to send out to the organizations to define what we mean and then to gauge the interest um, and so i got a message here that we've got uh, only a few minutes left and so uh, with that i'm actually gonna um, go through the next few slides here uh, quickly i can come back to any of these services if you'd like um, but um, let me just uh, finish my animation here abc and then abcd and uh, when we've got two more, so they're all defined here. And then uh, with that, that's the overview slide. And so as we've mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, now sending that out um, as a survey. And with that, I'll actually go one animation back here and I will open it up for any questions or uh, other comments. Thanks for that. This is Mike Tuggy. I do have a question about yes. rural health clinic status. Um, Cause I, I, we were doing some visits, you know, like annual wellness visits and, but our rural health clinics, when they put in the code for that visit, Medicare would not, um, did not count those towards our, our, uh, you know, some of our coding around like HCC coding. So we ran into some trouble doing telehealth for those types of visits. Yeah. Um, so they, there's definitely some work to do on trying to make sure that, I mean, telehealth is obviously necessary, really critical to our future, but we need to make sure that the work allows us to still capture metrics. Right, and, and to get the credit for it. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, yeah. yeah. Yep, you're right. Do you uh, find that in your, in your region as well? Oh, definitely. We certainly find it all around the country. I mean, it is essential that um, you have somebody who's staying on top of the changing regulatory and reimbursement pieces. We have someone in our team that does that. But, um, and I, you know, Sam in the assessment shared some of those with some of the individual organizations um, as well. So definitely, it is an evolving landscape and one that um, people need to stay on top of. Um, and it's one of the reasons we recommend in the performance metrics, um, looking at reimbursement on an ongoing basis, because sometimes it's a, a coding issue or a lack of knowledge issue. Um, and so it's always one of the key metrics that we recommend people put in place so that they're not um, surprised um, quarters later. The, the political willingness, the political willingness is there. It's now the bureaucracy that has to uh, uh, come after it, and then when yeah, I mean, we we get relatively quickly to reimbursement levels, and also for FKHCs, right? Uh, that previously were prohibited from doing telehealth in the way that we practice it now. Um, so reimbursement uh, was was clarified, but the, get, getting the credit for the annual wellness visits and other quality metrics, that's the second, third layer of uh, telehealth uh, Im impacts that has not been fully thought through. Um, so, and that's where um, lobbying and, and advocacy work um, uh, from organizations like NCACH or, or CTEL here in Washington mm -hmm. is, is paying off. Yeah, good. Good point. 
other comments, uh, observations? Uh, Christian, uh, my yes. name is Kathy Moret, and I'm involved with uh, school health services through the Great. Educational Service District. And I'm very anxious to see uh, WSU's data that they've collected and then how the two of you can put those together. Um, we have lots of students throughout the region that are so uh, in need of not only telehealth, but, but dental health and um, other opportunities. So it really opens up a lot of, of potential health uh, improvements for them. It, it does. It's amazing what it can do for a community, especially when the patients can stay at their place of work and remotely zoom in to a telehealth visit, right, with the three-way video conversation. So, so getting access to care, getting a dental examinations, teledentistry, um, those are, and, and telemental health as well, right? That's also very critical, especially in, in the high school environment or middle school environment, having access to, to, to mental health services uh, at in the comfort of the school. Um, there's, there's numerous opportunities to really provide excellent care uh, to that population. Anyone else? So we did attach this presentation to your, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ramona. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. It got, uh, really uh, got me thinking quite a bit, so appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much, Ramona. So the presentation was attached to the calendar invite um, for this meeting, so you should all have it. If you don't, please reach out to Teresa and she'll make sure you, um, you get it. Um, and we will send out the recording for this. Um, I would really like you to really pay attention to those last slides. You will be hearing from WSU um, next month. Um, and then I guess in April, we'll come and try to pull it all together um, on next step. So I'm um, really thinking about what we can do um, for our region. What are some of those regional supports resources, um, whether we're um, providing some of the um, education, technical assistance, or, or if we're working together to create some, some shared services um, across the region. I heard something that I never thought about, um, you guys may have, it just was kind of a light bulb for me, is that we're a, a really a closed unit here in North Central Washington, which allows us to really collaborate more than others around the state. Um, because most of our patients receive care within our region. Uh, they're not going, there are some care um, given in Spokane and Seattle, um, but the majority of it is really right here. So um, we have the opportunity to really work together um, and leverage resources across systems that will um, continue to allow for that competitiveness but, um, within each organization, but then um, kind of um, leverage some of the, the cost it is um, to implement these services um, and then to continue them. So really look at what we can do as a region, what you're interested in um, investing in, uh, at what level would you want to invest in for our region? Um, and then we'll tie that into WSU's and uh, presentation and, and pull it all together after that. One last opportunity for questions or comments. Thank you, Wendy. And Great. Chris. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you guys. And you all know that I have always one last thing to say. I love website manners. Can't wait to start. <laughs> to website manners. Website manners, yes. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> Yes, I know. I check a little about that. Good. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. We'll see you, see you uh, next month or in a couple of months, the latest. So, okay. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. All. And thank you, everyone, for all your time today. At uh, this time, I'm going to go ahead and we'll start the round table so that I can hear what everyone else is doing out there. Uh, kind of a temperature gauge, see how you're doing. So, I will start as I do normally with our roll call. So if you know who is in front of you, then you'll know you're up next. So, Carleen, round table, just what's going on? What are you thinking about? Yeah, I um, just been doing a lot of resiliency work and um, appreciate all the work that's been done here. Um, in terms of round table in 
I'm I'm in Colorado right now, so I had I was in and out uh, working on Marshall Fire stuff, and uh, so um, uh, so I don't have a whole lot to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming, Kathy. Marat. Oh, we're uh, uh, still quite uh, heavily involved in COVID related work. So, you know, uh, the the ESDs across the state are now the distributors of all of the um, testing kits for our for our school districts. So um, we're covering our four counties with testing kits on a weekly basis. There are there are thousands of tests being done. Um, across the school districts. So I think you would be amazed if you knew uh, how much work, how much clinical work is being done in the school settings. Um, I just finished this last week a, uh, a conference on uh, telehealth and implementing te telehealth and dental health. Um, you know, whether at the clinical setting or school-based settings. And uh, it was very interesting and uh, came away with a lot of uh, new information about um, telehealth services. And uh, so it was, I was really uh, excited to hear the presentation today. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what WSU um, is able to provide from a community feedback standpoint, because I do think uh, it's particularly in our region, our kids are so underserved and uh, not, not because of anyone's fault. It's really our rural setting. And we've got a lot of uh, rural kids, you know, a lot of poverty, uh, very limited resources for them. And so these types of opportunities uh, can really open up uh, some expanded health care for them. So it sounds like this was, uh, Wendy's presentation was timely for you. Perfect. So thank you, Kathy. Um, Deb Murphy. See if she's still here. Sometimes people have to jump off. So, Dell Anderson, I see you here. Yep. Sorry, I was so late today. I, I probably missed out on a lot of great information, but I, I wanted to just tell the group that I had the opportunity for our team to meet for the first time with Christian last week. And uh, one of the questions that was asked was, um, "How do you, how do you define telehealth?" I think we've we've used different components of telehealth, but uh, understand their definition of telehealth. And so from our mindset, we've been looking at it more as a medication management opportunity for individuals across our county to have access to, to med management. But really the, the broad definition is any type of distance, any care is provided over distance. So that could be phone, text, video. So it's just been a, just a good process to, to really learn about and expand our focus and not be so narrow. Very good, thank you, Dal. Hey, Sus Hernandez. Thank you, Molly. No, I, I think we had two very uh, strong presentations today to reflect on as a as as a group uh, in terms of the benefit to the region. Um, good board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ken Sterner. Not a whole lot going on. Uh, we've been busy, uh, as Kathy was saying, up to our necks in COVID, uh, working with long-term care facilities, trying to keep those under control and working with the health districts also and trying to make sure that folks in our outlying areas are by themselves are uh, getting the care that they need and uh, the testing equipment, the PPE and so forth. So more of the same that we've done for the last two years, let's put it that way. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Ken. Ramona Hicks. Hey, Molly. Um, really just more of the same as well. Uh, but I really want to say I, uh, both of these were very good. I really enjoyed the driving together. It just, that, that's a, a great uh, concept. And then the, everything on that telehealth, I, and I agree with you, the telehealth matters or the what, uh, uh, website matters was really good to think about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. My voice a little bit. Sorry about that. And um, Rebecca Davenport. I'm not sure if I see her at this time. Must have had to jump off. Rosalinda. Yeah, um, I agree. Two excellent topics. Very exciting, which is very needed right now because yeah, COVID is just dragging us down. In the last two years, you know, it has not been as great of an impact as it is right now. It's a significant number of staffing interruptions that has not been fun to deal with. Lots of lots of nights and weekend work going on over the last few weeks. But um, 
I know definitely need this exciting work to keep moving us forward and, and keep our heads up and our eyes forward um, as we continue through the pandemic. But in addition to work that we're doing with the NCACH, we're also jumping in with two feet into the DEI um, training and workshops here for our facility. The Washington State Hospital Association has an excellent program starting. I think it's a five, five it's series of five workshops that hospitals uh, are doing. So we're pretty excited about uh, moving that work forward in our healthcare systems. So thank you. Good job, staff. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tuggy, thoughts? Yes, we are we are digging out, you know, from COVID. It's sort of, things are starting to actually improve in the hospital, and uh, so now we're really looking at in our uh, at our population health reactivating that more. Now that we have more staff that they'll be not committed with inpatient work, but now back to outpatient work. So that's going to really help us move it forward. Thank you, Cat. You still out there? You are. Any last thoughts? Yeah, this is a great meeting. Um, something, you know, the things that stood out to me, just so folks are aware, uh, Community Health Plan of Washington, Community Health Network of Washington has just been moving through our strategic planning process and a lot of alignment. Um, telehealth is a key priority for, for us as well as uh, equity um, and moving that forward. We are also working on projects to really further embed patient partnership from design to evaluation. So, you know, a lot of the elements that came forward in Monty's presentation just really resonate across um, the work that we're doing. One other update I just wanted to provide is that uh, we have uh, um, Gerardo Perez Aguerrero, who's starting as CHPW's uh, North Central Regional Manager. He started on um, last week. And so just so folks may, uh, he has been in the region for a while. Um, with uh, a, a different organization, uh, but is now uh, our regional manager for uh, for North Central. So if folks are seeing him around, um, he'll be joining us at different ACH meetings um, in the future as well. Thank you, Kat. Nancy, our newest board member. Well, for my first meeting, <laughs> not that I haven't attended some other meetings, but actually a meeting that I had to think about myself in a different way. Um, the first thing that came to mind in the telehealth is that I just last week went uh, and had my physical with a uh, actual brand new doctor because my doctor has gotten to the dark side of administration and, uh, <laughs> and uh, how I could have just gotten online and had the same conversation with him <laughs> would have been kind of nice. And I don't live that far away from the clinic, but I can imagine for people who have to drive that that would be really, really a helpful thing. Um, as far as the field of early childhood goes, child care providers are struggling big time these days with COVID. Uh, closures of their programs and their, their centers uh, are continuing to, to happen um, more than really, many of them have reported to me, especially in my classes, that more than they had to in the beginning. And the hard part for them is that in the beginning, if they had children on childcare subsidy, they received reimbursement based on the month. Now that has gone away. And so if they close for a week, they have no, they have no incomes coming in. So it, it is, it continues to be a struggle for childcare. It does. it does. Yeah. And we keep that on our radar. Now that we are um, expanding some of our communication, the partners, I have Linda Parlett. Do you have some final words on this round table? No, I thought it was very interesting. And, um, uh, I have been texting uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers through this whole meeting, and I just reminded her about the rural health clinics and federally qualified health clinics on reimbursement. So, um, yeah, it's I'm proud of all of you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and now since I see some other names out here, what uh, Deb Miller? Do you have any thoughts about today? How was your meeting? Well, I feel pretty overwhelmed as a community partner, but uh, both Kelsey and I were commenting that we'll be um, anxious to hear the report about community-based telehealth um, at a future meeting. 
I think that'll be really important for our care coordination, community-based care coordination. And that's all I'm gonna to report today. Thanks, Molly. Thank you, yeah. Lisa, I see you popped up. Well, I've been on for every minute. I am in soaking mode and Nancy's probably laughing at me because she knows of my information hunger and I had no idea she was gonna be the new board member because I sit on lots of other meetings with Nancy. So uh, no, this is great. And and my board meetings with Nancy are so childcare, not board, but we are so child care focused that it's exciting to have something health focused because nurse that I am, nurse hat that I wear, that's the way I think, so. Elsie? Anything? I think, oh, there you are, hi. Uh, so it, this is a great um, board meeting and also um, the Shlan Douglas Chai some months ago, we touched on the vital conditions and how they play a role in the social determinants of health. So it was great to hear a little more about that. And also to put a plug in for the Schlan Douglas Try, our next meeting is on Wednesday and we have switched the time. Um, so it's now from 10 to 11.30 and we will be focusing on oral health and the impact it has on um, overall health. Okay, thank you so much. Did some staff, staff wanna speak up or we can go ahead. We're getting close to the end. I wanna keep everyone's calendar in mind. So it is open, open floor if there's anyone who wants to say anything. I'll just comment, you know, again, well, to get, to kick off the year. One thing I wanna also just put out there, you know, as we're talking and obviously Molly is demonstrating us connecting with other partners and other individuals, you know, board members, if there are, you know, community members or community organizations you feel like would be worth us having more of a conversation with, please feel free to reach out to me or the staff and make those connections. We can't connect with everyone out there all at once, um, but the more we can continue to expand our network, the better. And so I just encourage you all to actively help us build up that network. Thank you, yeah, yes. Yeah, so and I think I've said it before in months past, to, we need to be thinking now about who else needs to be at the table, who's missing. So that's an important piece, yes, as we go forward. Any other final co conversation or thought? Otherwise, I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting right now. Hi, this at, is Wendy. I just, yes. I just wanted to uh, remind you that the behavioral health stakeholder meeting is starting uh, tomorrow, February 8th at noon. I'll drop that link one more time in the chat that leads to the blog that has all the dates. Feel free to download um, the calendar invite. Um, we have some really exciting stuff going on with that. And um, a lot of individuals from multiple sectors have reached out. Um, there's a hunger for change and a hunger for working together. So, um, Feel free to, to join us. Yes, and the partner convenings is on the 22nd as well. So be on the lookout for that. All right, at this time, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting and thank you everyone for coming. And, and this was a great, great meeting, a lot of good information. I'm gonna look more into thriving, actually. I do like that concept. So <laughs> thank you all. Bye everybody. Thank you all.